I met Greg Baird back in 2010. I volunteered at the Center on Halstead, which is an LGBT outreach center here in Chicago. And I met him, he was speaking at an event alongside Judy Shepard, who's the mother of Matthew Shepard. A couple of years later, I volunteered for one of her book signings. He was there again. And just a couple months ago, I was volunteering for a show that was written about Matthew Shepard, honoring him and his legacy. And lo and behold, in the audience is Greg Baird. <laughs> <laughs> After I had a very brief exchange with him, and now we're all here today. So I was very excited to help share the story that Greg is going to bring to you about Matthew Shepard and the work that he does. In 1998, I was working in higher education at North Central Michigan College in Petoskey, Michigan. And it was a fantastic job. I was director of residence life and student activities. I was also the adjunct theater teacher. That's my background. Probably not a surprise. But I taught it. Yeah. I taught acting and uh, directing, and I loved that job. But I also was director of the lecture series, which, uh, you know, multitasked many different things. In 1998, I, uh, while taking care of the residence hall, I had a student in my residence hall named Larry. And I like talking about Larry because I feel we all can learn from this. I'm a very observant person, and so Larry was in my residence hall of about 120 students I had, and I knew he was having some difficulty in coming out. And I was out on campus, I was like the token gay guy, and everybody knew like if there was an issue, um, they would come talk to me or a counselor, which I was more than happy to do. I saw Larry kind of exploring and trying to come out, but I was in a real conservative area, so doing so, may have jeopardized a lot of things in his life and his school education. Well, he had come up to me midweek in February, and he said, Greg, I want you to know that I'm gay. I'm, he goes, I'm kind of like you. I'm like, well, that's great, Larry. And so I gave him some resources and asked him if he was fine. He goes, oh, I'm really good. I'm finding that people are really supportive of me. I'm like, fantastic. So a few days later, Friday rolled around, and he said, Greg, I want you to know I'm going to have my coming out party off campus. Now, couldn't drink on campus, and we know no college students drink or smoke weed in the residence hall. <laughs> Ever. Ever. <laughs> so I said to him, just be careful when you're off campus. And a lot of my residence hall students, along with some community people, were going to be at this party. About 11.30 that night, I'm sitting in my apartment. My apartment was off the lobby of the residence hall, and I had a phone call directed from the front desk. They were correct, there's somebody from Family Video, when we used to rent video at the video store, uh, on the phone for you. And I go, God, did I not pay something? And I'm like, why are they calling me at 11.30? And a young man was on the phone, and he said, Greg, um, you're the residence hall supervisor, the residence hall director, right? I said, yeah. And he goes, well, I think I have one of your students out on a snowbank next to my building. This is February in Northern Michigan. Mm -hmm. And I said, what are you talking about? Because do you know a Larry, and I can't recall the last name. And uh, I said, yeah. He says, well, we found him on a snowbank outside when I was taking out the garbage with no coat on. And he was passed out and looked like he'd just been thrown in the snowbank. <laughs> And he said, we're calling an ambulance, and we're taking him down to the hospital. And I said, I'll be right there. Got in my car, drove down, ambulance had already arrived, uh, and it was at the hospital. But granted, it's a small town. Got to the hospital, I'm fairly well known. I got to the emergency room, they knew who I was. I said, um, I'd like to see Larry. And the nurses kind of looked at one another very awkwardly and said, well, we need to tell you something before you go in there. And I go, well, what is that? So they're leading me back there. He goes, well, first off, he's passed out and snoring. I said, okay. Is he well? He says, well, he almost had hypothermia because he was thrown out on the snow ring. I said, okay. He says, well, somebody, wherever he was at prior to this, decided it would be funny to draw things with a black marker on his face and his hands, and my heart just sunk. And I said, well, what do you mean? They said, well, they took a Sharpie and they made his fingernails, his hands on his fingernails look like a woman's, like it was effeminate. I said, okay. And he says, well, on the face, well, you can see. So he opened up the curtain. And what somebody had done at this party, because they didn't approve of him being gay, on one cheek said faggot, and the other cheek it said bitch boy. And it broke my heart. It was somebody that I'm taking care of that is now in the hospital. 
So I asked her, are you able to clean that off? She goes, yeah, we have something that'll take all of that off. And so when he wakes up, call me, I'll be there. So 4.30 in the morning, I get a call, I'll go pick him up. Of course, he's completely hungover. Didn't remember anything. Didn't know how he got there or, or whatever. So a few days later, he was piecing, piecing things together and he found out what had happened. Um, and there was a, a young couple, straight couple, within my residence hall that did not group with gay people. And they thought it would be funny if they got him really drunk, drew all over him and threw him in the snow bank with no coat on in February in which he could have died. This is what happens to a lot of gay kids if you come out and you have some kind of a hate crime happen to you. But Larry did not want to press any charges because he lived with these people. He didn't want to do anything because he didn't want his parents to find out because he was not out in fear of if he had done anything and his parents found out that his college money, his tuition, would be revoked and he would have no place to stay and no tuition to go to college. How sad Actually, is that? Actually, he was born and raised in southeastern Michigan in a small town of about 7,000 people. My father owned a hardware store in the town and my mother was a stay-at-home mom and took care of who, her two adopted sons, which is a unique story in itself. Uh, I have no sisters. My brother and I are both adopted. One. We're both adopted from different families. Two. Anyone want to guess what the third one is? We're both gay. <laughs> My friend said, wow, are your parents lucky? And I'm like, yeah. I'm sure they thought that too when they both found out. I am a huge believer in personal storytelling because I think it changes hearts and minds. It dispels myths, uh, untruths, and it opens our hearts. And I, I really feel it creates change. We often live in fear of what we don't know. And a lot of it stems from when we're not sharing stories with one another and talking about who we are. Our lovely gadgets that we're hooked up to um, that do a lot of good for us often separate us because we're not talking about who we are. It's easier to send a text message than to sit down with somebody nowadays. So if you have the opportunity and you're, and you're hooked to your device, put it down once in a while and talk to somebody and get to know uh, who that person is because you may understand that uh, our differences should be celebrated and it's something that my teaching growing up that our differences were always something uh, of a negative. They're different, they're not like us, so we're not gonna hang out with them. And that's not necessarily true. It's our differences that are celebrated where we can all come together and find out actually how alike we are. I was writing the column in the Tri-City Times, our local paper called Clowning Around, and I did like movie reviews and stuff. And then I turned the tables because I wrote about something very serious that happened to me in a health class. And it was our football player, a bunch of football players were in there, but the coach was teaching the health class. And he would cover over um, some sexual issues, but uh, how to dress wounds and taking care of yourself. It was, a, it, it was a big blow off class, to be honest with you. But there was about 30 of us in there. And there was a young kid in there that got bullied all the time. And they brought him up to the front of the class, and the coach signified to have the door closed by one of the football players. And the football players wrapped him up, his name was Michael, wrapped him up in gauze like a mummy, because we were talking about slings and wounds and things like that. And they laid him on the floor, and everybody was laughing. I was horrified. And I knew it wasn't right. The bell rang, and the football players picked him up, and stretched him across in front of the door, and to leave, you were required to walk over him, how degrading, and go out in the hallway. And I pondered about this for the longest time. I was the last one out, and I told the coach, I'm not walking over him. I'm going to move him and walk around him. He goes, oh, no. He goes, do you enjoy this class? I, uh, a little bit. He goes, do you want a good grade? I could not believe this as a teacher telling me this. I said, yeah, and my scores are good. I grabbed his feet, and I walked out. I wrote about that in the local paper, in Clowning Around. The paper came out about two days later. Now, you have to understand, my parents were going through a divorce at the time, so my mom's home alone. And the day the paper came out that, that afternoon, I'm downstairs in the basement working on some government thing. And my mom yells down and goes, there's a school teacher here that wants to talk to you. 
And I'm like, oh, I'm in trouble or something. And he comes down. It was the coach of my health class. And he came downstairs, and he said, do you know why I'm here? And I said, no. He goes, I read your paper, I read your article in the paper today. I'm like, oh. And he goes, did you mean all that stuff that you said? And I, well, I just wrote what I personally thought about what happened, and it wasn't right. And he goes, do you mind like talking to the principal when you come in tomorrow and really tell them that didn't all happen? And I said, no. I go, that did happen. And again, he said, do you enjoy my class? And I said, I enjoy your class. He went, well. And it, it was just the weirdest situation I ever been in. But I felt very empowered. And I always tell people, you need to speak out when you see injustice, then be complacent, because a lot of us just walk past and let things go. And it was the first time I didn't let things go. He got in a whole lot of trouble. I stayed in the class. He was, he was told not to treat me any differently from what I heard through the grapevine. And I ended up getting a B plus in the class and succeeded. But that was the first time I really experienced any kind of bullying. Uh, and, I, and I often tell people, you know, we, we need to understand when the kids are bullied and they're in school, they're not learning. They're going from, you know, in class, they're thinking about how am I going to get from point A to point B. So how am I going to get from my English class to my math class? And what hallway am I going to go down without being smashed against a locker, somebody saying something to me inappropriate? Somebody chasing me, somebody after me, whatever the case may be, some kind of social cruelty so I can go. And they're not learning. And we talked about policies being involved with schools and stuff. Everybody needs to be on board with that.